Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Yakey. And I'm Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. Welcome back to the Fire em Up Doctors Good Medicine DocuSeries. We are so glad you joined us. We want to provide you with credible health resources, guide you in your treatment options, and fire you up to take control of your health. Next, um, we have a image of our cover of our book, as well as the foreword, who was done by um, Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld. He's going to be speaking and telling us what he wrote. The foreword of this book was written by Professor Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld, who is a world-renowned immunologist. He is the editor-in-chief of Autoimmunity Reviews, co-editor of Journal of Autoimmunity, and author of Infections and Autoimmunity and The Mosaic of Autoimmunity. The foreword will be read by a narrator. The COVID virus, what do we have to know? This new epidemic is characterized by an avalanche of clinical and scientific publications, a phenomenon of no precedence. This book, written by Dr. Anjali Mon Aki and Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith, is a successful effort to encompass all the knowledge accumulated thus far in a simple way. They should be blessed for their efforts. It entails details about this peculiar virus, its infectivity, sensitivities, and pathogenicity. The corona epidemic differs from other infections by the speed of spread, 10 to 20 times more infective, the destruction of tissue and the respiratory tract, the occurrence of a severe infectious situation called sepsis, which is associated with a storm of immunological inflammatory substances named cytokines, cytokine storm, and quick death in predisposed subjects, especially in elderly people with comorbidities. It has peculiar clinical presentations like sudden fever, severe dry cough, and also a loss of smell and taste. We are presently learning the effectiveness of combined therapies to prevent the infectivity and to combat the cytokine storm. I believe that this book will lead others to have a better understanding of the pandemic. The authors will have to update the book as our knowledge progresses. Meanwhile, as a reader, take care of yourself and listen to the recommendations of the authorities. And now we're going to start our Fire Em Up Doctors webinar, and I'd like to introduce your Fire Em Up Doctors, Dr. Anjali Mon Aki and Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. This community knows me quite well. We've been together for many years, 20, 21 years here in Gainesville. For this pandemic, we've been together for 10 weeks straight, every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. So I'd like to reintroduce uh, my teaching partner for the past two years, Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith, who you see in her office in Boston. And we, our passion is to make, um, is to make hard concepts easy. And so we've actually spent two years, hi everybody, <laughs> it works. So we spent the past two years getting our ideas together primarily to teach physicians all around the world. We've literally been around the world together, teaching in Spain and, and um, Italy and you know in, in, in America. So uh, we have taught physicians primarily on a web basis, but we've also had a passion to go direct to consumer, to you all, to make hard concepts easy. And so we actually presented at Dr. Schoenfeld's conference last year in Florence, Italy, last March, Dr. O'Neill Smith and I, with really complex cases, two lupus cases and one alopecia or, or um, loss of hair in a young boy. And we really have developed a nice relationship with him. And he is the preeminent uh, immunologist in the whole world. And he wrote that beautiful forward to our book, right, Dr. Kathleen? Uh, it's amazing. He is world renowned. He is a, a teacher of teachers, us. We are the teachers and he is a teacher of us. And he is just one of the most caring doctors that you could ever meet. Brilliant and caring. So proud. I feel so proud. 
So after that conference, Dr. O'Neill Smith and I got to work writing a book called Fine Tune Your Immune System, which we've been working on for uh, over a year. And we were going to present it to our patients in Italy in a conference, a retreat and workshop. But then it all got canceled for the coronavirus pandemic. So we put our brains together and said, you know what we really need is we need a book to help um, people fortify their immune system. And that's what this book is about, Kick COVID-19 to the Curb, the go-to guide to fortifying your immune system. And so Dr. O'Neill Smith has been my ear with managing very difficult situations right here in Gainesville, Florida. We care for 6,000 patients of which five we manage with the COVID-19 infection. And a lot of these questions have come through this town hall forum, as well as group medical visits, as well as telehealth, um, as well as meeting you all outside at drive up evaluations. Uh, about 12 of us spent the morning doing modified drive up evaluations, doing antibody testing. Dr. Kathleen, we did 20 of them, and we'll talk about that later in the show. Um, but I just want to thank you for, for committing uh, to join us here. And so, with Boston coming in through Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith, we have rebranded this series, the Fire em Up Doctors webinar. And thank you all for joining us. This is number one in the Fire em Up Doctors webinar. It's amazing. I mean, we were planning to be teaching on this particular topic, fortifying the immune system, making your immunity top, top priority. And then we began this process of navigating this unimaginable disruption that was caused by the spread of COVID-19. And I assure you, our listeners, that your well-being is our number one priority. And I think that what we attempted to do in this book, because we couldn't do it with people in person, is to compile quick, easy, actionable steps that you can take from this guide, kick COVID to the curb, so that you can take control of your health and you can not only survive this epidemic, but you can thrive in this epidemic and the ones that follow. So we are so grateful uh, that, that Dr. Kathleen has agreed to join us until the pandemic is over every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. Dr. Kathleen is a Harvard trained doctor and an Olympian and an Olympic coach. And she actually, her first career was actually as a high school science teacher and then a college science teacher prior to going into medicine. So she is really great at taking hard science and making it easy. And I think you'll really hear that all throughout the book. One thing I'd like to actually show you is how easy this is. Today, Dr. Kathleen, we were doing um, guidebook curbside delivery of our book. And actually in one um, SUV, there was the patient up front and then her five-year-old daughter in the back seat. And I was explaining some of the pictures to the five-year-old and she was definitely intrigued. Uh -huh. And this is on the inside back cover of the book and it's right behind me. So this is our story. Um, now might be a good time to go ahead and tell you a little bit about how we make stories to make it easy so you get a flavor for this guidebook. So basically right behind me, is uh, Immunity 101. And you are the king of your castle. Your body is your castle. You do not want to become a casualty of the COVID-19 pandemic. So when we talk about your immune system, we talk about the two arms, the innate immunity, which is inflammatory, it's rapid. And it involves non-specific defenses like the barriers, like your mucosal membranes, et cetera. A lot of our uh, population know about leaky gut and the barrier there and how that can be disrupted. On the other arm is the adaptive immunity. It's like these special forces, they need to be trained. And out of the adaptive immunity comes the antibodies. And that's why with antibody formation, it takes a little time to train special forces, especially when we've never seen SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that caused, is currently causing this pandemic. But within there, there's stories within stories. So for example, we talked about the cells with, and we make analogies like the frontline cells uh, are the pawns, they're expendable, they're like your white blood cells. And then you have the special forces that we say are, are queens and knights and bishops. And through that all, we weave an analogy so that you know immuno, immunology 101 and you know how to fortify your immune system. Of course. I mean, whenever you're going to be invaded by anything, there has to be some sort of disruption. And so fortification has to occur in order for that disruption to be broken up, right? So we want to basically help you understand just basic action, 
easy, actionable steps that will help you to fortify against any potential disruption. And we are convinced that we can help you thrive and not just survive this pandemic. The basic principles that we teach in terms of decreasing fire or inflammation, rust and oxidative stress, and regulating your immune system will serve you well so that you can actually leave this pandemic healthier than when you started it. Well, and the most important thing that I think you can leave here with is that our guide is backed with medical research. That's really important. And the research that we've included with our guide urges the importance of a healthy and a strong immune system. So we use the, the research in order to create the actionable program that you can look at and you can apply to yourself. Maybe you already take vitamin C to fortify your immune system, but maybe you don't take zinc. Or maybe you, there's something else that you didn't know that kind of spark creates a spark in you or a reaction in you that you may want to consider adding to your fortification program. So I think that we're not able in this type of a format to individualize and to customize these, but we give you lots of information for you to use your own intuition as to how you might be able to use the data that we're providing for you based upon your history at what you might need to add to fortify your immunity and to prevent any disruption. And even so if you if get sick, even if you get sick with COVID-19, you don't have to fear. You can be the person who recovers readily. It's not gonna be easy for seven or 14 days, but you'll recover possibly just with Tylenol. Not even, you know, you'll have your, your doctor, your primary physician, your primary healthcare provider available to you, but you'll be able to be home and feel confident that you're going to survive this and then thrive subsequently with antibodies, as Dr. Iggy was talking about earlier. Dr. Kathleen, that reminds me of patient number three. He's a 62-year-old retired Army veteran who worked out really hard, continues to work out. Actually, we think got a COVID-19 infection in the gym. He had a fever to 102 and called me. I, I did a drive-up evaluation, did a COVID swab in March, and three days later, it was positive. He actually, when I did a telehealth to see how he was doing on that Monday, his fever had come down to about 100, but he was begging to start doing push-ups and sit-ups. So here's a man who demonstrates what you said. He went into it healthy, and so within a week, he's normal. Absolutely. And I think when we get into antibody production, we, we can bring him up again and talk about what you found, you know, subsequently for him. And I have a patient who's a woman, you know, middle age, 40 to 55, who essentially also is a very, very healthy, very health oriented, lives, is, a, is from Italy, lives a Mediterranean lifestyle, exercises regularly, sleeps really well and takes good care of herself. And she too became infected. We don't know how silent transmission and ended up being at home. And essentially within 10 days, only using Tylenol and the other supplementation that she's been using previously for fortifying her immune system and adding a couple of things based on her own story, you know, throughout those 10 to 14 days, she did brilliantly well. Within 14 days, she was back, you know, back in the back in the workforce, back out there working and feeling strong. And it's now been about three to four weeks and she is doing great. She's reinvented herself, you know, based on that little down spell, which she had a lot of time to think. It wasn't easy to get through. We spoke every day, but there was nothing that she needed other than the supplementation she was taking and some Tylenol. And she's, you know, that's a, that's a good sign. That's someone who's proactive about their health from a lifestyle perspective, and then also from what am I going to do to make it even stronger? So in our book, we talk about it as fortifying your castle walls and making the moat deeper so you don't get penetrated in the first place. But if you plugged all the holes and got ready for this, you will be getting through unscathed, of which the statistics say at least 81% of people who, who get COVID-19 infection get through relatively unscathed. So uh, we're hoping that actually for, we've been messaging this for the past two, three months, Dr. Kathleen, that our sole mission at our regional practice, North Florida Integrative Medicine, is to get our 6,000 patients through to July 4th unscathed. And so far we've been doing knock wood really well with that. 
Well, I think the best thing too, in addition to just taking it in small steps, you know, you can't win the football game and you, you, you all know this in Gainesville, you can't win the football game in the first quarter. You can try, but really you never know what's going to happen. So you've got to get to July 4th and you just put one step in front of the other. And then you continue to add and adapt and evolve with the things that we learn. And that's why we're going to keep people updated right on our website, firemupdoctors.com. And then also through these webinars, we want people to understand what is the what information is coming out and how are they going to discern what's useful, what's true, what's helpful to them. And that's really the important thing because beyond July 4th, I don't believe this bug is going away. I don't believe we need to fear the bug. I think we need to take actionable steps. We need to be proactive in order to, and, and basically taking in the information and understanding it in order to create the game plan to win the game. Absolutely. So, um, We've had over a hundred patients of ours for the past 10 weeks, and this is the first time of us together. So we promised in this new format that we would do brief update for five, 10 minutes regionally, both in at North Florida and in Boston. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then we'll move to a FAQ update, uh, which is updating our book, our guidebook, which is actually already posted on our website. So for the my, my regional patients, North Florida Integrated Medicine, please start looking for this material at our combined website called firemupdoctors.com. That's F-I-R-R-I-M up doctors.com. We posted already all of these references onto the website. Over 160 references and hyperlinks are on the, ref on the website, whether or not you picked up the guidebook. You can order the guidebook there, but also we'll be putting this recording onto that website as well as our Fire Up Doctors um, Facebook page. So if you if your friends and family didn't get a chance to watch this, they can watch it there. And also we're live streaming on Facebook now. And again, Dr. Kathleen, who you know, just meeting her now is absolutely brilliant. Uh, we'll be putting it um, on our Facebook page as well for your friends and family. Okay, so let's update you with North Florida. So we did the, the guidebook launch today. Uh, 20 people came and got a signed guidebook. They also had point of care testing, Dr. Kathleen. And I'll go through what we found within our 6,000 patient community in terms of um, positivity with serology testing, which isn't much, which tells me our population here at North Florida Integrated Medicine is really, really healthy at this point. So I'll go through that, the statistics with the slide in a minute, but we're really happy that we were able to launch in North Florida, our um, kick COVID to the curb not, um, guidebook. And I know we'll do, be doing Boston in the future. So here's some statistics um, from North Florida, and then we'll move on to Boston. Oh, well, first, this is the, the national landscape. Um, next slide. Yes, this is, um, Go back one, go back to the slide with the guidebook. So in, in, at North Florida Integrative Medicine, we actually, um, we actually have a lot of uh, interns that are helping us. And we basically spent the morning doing point of care testing. They were also the ones that helped refine and pull the bibliography tomorrow um, together for this. And actually during this week in particular, we've asked that the governor declare today, May 29th, um, in honor of healthcare workers who have uh, been injured and succumbed um, to the pandemic. And so it was late notice this year, but he'll probably end up doing it next year. And we wanted to thank Senator Keith Perry for that. But basically there was a statistic that came out two days ago that in the United States, 62,000 doctors and nurses have been infected of which 291 have died. And so we, we dedicated the guidebook in honor of them. And so getting back to where we are with statistics in Gainesville. So um, let's go back actually to the United States. The United States, there's 1.7 million confirmed cases. Go back to the statistics. Uh, 102,000 deaths of which 399,000 have recovered. Uh, 15 million have been tested. Bringing it back to Florida, uh, 951,000 tested, 53,000 confirmed. The testing rate here in Florida is uh, about 4,400 per 100,000 people, and we've had about 10,000 hospitalized, which given the fact that we have a lot of international travelers and tourism 
uh, and a lot of seniors, we've actually done pretty well, in my opinion. Um, looking at Alachua County, we've had 372 confirmed, of which five of those are ours. Seven have died, knock wood, nobody has died in our practice. And then the statistics, according to the Gainesville Sun, our local, local paper says that uh, they've had 719 antibody tests, of which 5% have been positive for antibodies as of uh, May 26. However, our population of 6,000 patients, uh, and we've been really proactive with these town halls, we've been social distancing, we've been asking people to make sure that they, they shelter at home. We've done 74 serology tests of which only two have been positives. And those two positives were patient zero, Julie who traveled from Italy who had two negative COVID swabs. And I subsequently did a positive antibody test on her. And the other positive has been uh, patient number four, a frontline healthcare worker um, at this point. So that's what we're looking like in Alachua County, specifically though at, at our practice, NFIM or North Florida Integrated Medicine. So not a whole lot of seroprevalence, at least with our, within my specific community of over 6,000 patients, Dr. Kathleen. Mm. In Boston, we have a lot more. I mean, I think it, you know, I think Boston and New York, um, the key thing is that we've had that the conference, the Biogen conference really put us on the map because the, that the people who attended that conference, it's a scientific conference. They were from all over the world, from China, from Italy, from all over the world. So that was a little bit of where this all began in Boston. But I don't know, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. So we can only use the numbers that we have, but within one county, which is Suffolk, Suffolk County is a county within Boston. It's the biggest county. It's Boston downtown, Boston proper, and a little bit of the surrounding area areas. And, you know, Boston's dense, nothing like New York. And so there have been just about 17,700, almost 18,000 cases that have been confirmed. And the deaths in general are quite low at 852 in the scheme of things. And essentially that the majority, sadly and unfortunately, were in the most vulnerable. The people who basically couldn't protect themselves, people in nursing homes. At least 50% of those de deaths are in nursing home vulnerable people who obviously don't have the most fortified immune system. So that's an issue. There are, however, a hundred year old patients or people who have recovered from this. So you can fortify your immune system at any age, regardless of your current status. You've got to put one foot in front of the other and know that every penny in the bank, so to speak, you know, essentially is effective. So in Boston recently, I think it was last week, uh, maximum 10 days ago, they did a study and they took 750 participants from the lower socioeconomic areas and they brought them and they did testing. So there is a really large uh, confirmed caseload in a, an area called Chelsea and they checked some people from Chelsea, some people from a variety of the different neighborhoods we call them in Boston and they found that 10% tested positive with antibodies. So we're, so I, Essentially, within my practice, I'm finding a similar antibody testing. You know, the people who are testing antibody positive in my practice have all had symptoms, have all stayed home for a minimum of seven days and a maximum of 21 days with an illness. None of them have gone to the hospital. And I would say that we've also got about a 10% antibody positivity rate, but many of those people tested negative with PCR. In the early days, they could not get PCR testing. So in March, they were unable to get PCR testing, but in the subsequent days in April, the people who were had tested positive with antibodies in my practice basically demonstrated, um, also tested negative. I'd say the majority of my people were negative with PCR nasal swab testing, but they 10% showed positivity with antibody testing. And I think that's, that's pretty encouraging. We'll talk a little bit more about antibodies in a bit, but I think that's pretty encouraging. So we're not near herd immunity and that's, you know, a, a big part of our book and how do we get to herd immunity and herd immunity has to be upwards of 50%. So in a positive light, in a negative light, it would be 70%. But if we just look at 50% as something to hope for and to strive for, we're at 10% presently. So this is not going away fast. Yeah, so just think about in our community here at North Florida Integrated Medicine, so we have 6,000 patients. And so in order to obtain herd immunity, 3,600 of you all would have to have positive antibodies 
And at this point, we only have two that we know of. So we're far from herd immunity here in our population at North Florida Integrative Medicine. So that's why we're gonna be with you for the long haul. Um, yeah, so I wanna move on to the reason why we're to, we, we are calling this doctor, do, there's a Dr. Stanton who's a PhD, retired public health service. He said that our book, uh, at the, our book, adding a cherry on top, they combine their work with online resources so that it never goes out of date. So what we intend to do is every week we'll pick one kick COVID-19 to the curb frequently asked question. So it's in part four of our book. We, we did eight, so this will be nine, launching with the first um, combined webinar. And we're gonna pick one FAQ update to make sure that this guidebook stays up to date. So this is the topic for today. It's actually, um, it, the question is, are there any animal studies that suggest the antibodies from COVID-19 protect you from reinfection? Well, I, I also wanna say, Dr. Ricky, that, that one of the key things is that you, everybody will know from whatever they read in the online, on print or online or whatever they hear, it's, this is not an easy task. To, in order to decipher what this information means is not an easy task. It's something that requires a team, and we've got a great team in Florida with Dr. Aki, an amazing team, so proud to be part of that team. And I think that you have to understand that not only looking at the medical components of it, but having an understanding of the mathematical models and the statistical models and what are these, what does all of this information mean and how can it be useful to you? It's not easy to do that. And we really want to be the trusted leaders, you know, that have, have gotten on top of this by now and that will continue to grow and evolve with all the information that's available to help you understand in these animal studies, in these human studies, what are antibodies and what do they do? And what is a vaccine and what does it do? And is it gonna be useful or not? And who is it gonna be useful to or not? So look at working through these frequently asked questions with you that we've experienced both in our practices and in the, with our friends and family, constantly asking questions and, and, and demonstrating what their lack of information or what they don't understand based upon what they've read or heard. We wanna be that trusted source for you. We wanna answer your questions and we wanna provide, you know, this, this seamless understanding at whatever level you're at of the studies that are being done. Without ado, Dr. Aki. Yeah, so the question we had discussed in previous town hall meetings was if you had immunoglobulin G, does that mean that you're protected? If your antibodies were positive, does that mean that you won't get reinfected again? And we had previously set, talked about the 2007 article that looked at SARS-1 or SARS-CoV-1, and it looked like there was high levels of antibodies for at least two years out. So what we wanted to present here was that it, even with this particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, a preliminary study coming out of China uh, showed that a uh, small number of rhesus monkeys, so there were seven rhesus monkeys that actually they infected and as they were recovering, tried to infect it again and they couldn't reinfect them. And so there's- What we're looking at are your 5% and my 10% of these people who have antibodies who were infected, are they going to get reinfected, right? right? That's the question we're, that we're trying to answer. If you test positive with antibodies, what happens next? Are you going to get, are you likely to get reinfected? Go ahead, I apologize. No, no, the, I mean, you framed the question beautifully. So what we're saying is that because we don't know yet in humans, because we're early in this pandemic, um, that this is hopeful that at least in China, when they infected these really cute, I actually went to India with my son two years ago to check out curcumin in, in the great fields. And um, these rhesus monkeys were literally just hanging on trees and hanging out and you wanted to make sure you didn't eat around them because they jump on you. But anyway, they're in lab animal models in China, they showed at least seven of them could, they could not reinfect uh, once they had started to recover from their initial infection. So there's some hope here, at least in animal models with this particular virus, that they are, they are protective or neutralizing. And we spend quite a bit of time of that in the immune section of part two of our guidebook. Well, I think one of the key things about that is rhesus monkeys are, I think, 93.7% similar to us humans. And that's really important to understand. So 
it's not, we don't take lightly taking animals and infecting them or anything like that, which is why it's a small study. No one would ever do a large scale study on this. And the good news was that these seven rhesus monkeys who were infected initially, you know, all recovered. And it took about 14 days in order for them to recover. They had their peak viral load earlier than we think humans do, maybe two days earlier. So at three days from the time they were infected, they had viral load or they had COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus in their system. And it predominantly went to the lungs and the gut. And then within 14 days post-infection, they had undetectable amounts of viral load, none detected in their blood. And so then the question was, was did they develop these antibodies? And here you can see an antibody test. And so about 21 days, 14 to 21 days post this initial infection, we, it was noted in this study, this, this is a preliminary report, it's a preprint, it has not been published yet. Um, but what they noted was that the neutralizing antibodies, the IgG antibodies were increasing. So it took two weeks for recovery, but they continued to have increasing antibodies 14 to 21 days post the initial infection. So 28 days later, they gave them another infection with COVID-19. So that's during their early recovery to see would they get reinfected. And what happened in four of these monkeys that they attempted to reinfect 28 days later, they were already better. They did not produce detectable viral load particles. So that's really important. So basically what they also found was that no viral, they couldn't detect the virus, whether through swab or, or blood testing. They did not clinically get very, very sick at all, like the first round of infection, and that their antibody titers were significantly higher than with the initial infection. Now, we can't translate this directly to humans, but it's promising. And we need to continue to study this. And we need to, the goal is to track infectious status. The people who are becoming infected to track their status with respect to how long will their antibodies last? And here you can see that in that green line, they're going out beyond 21 days. That line is really elevated, beginning at 11, 14, and continuing to go out past 28 days, which is on the x-axis at the bo bottom, where you see the number 28. So as that green line continues, what we're trying to understand is how long will it continue? How long will that continue after you've had an infection to prevent you from becoming reinfected with the next wave. So that's really important and it's really hopeful that at least in rhesus monkeys that there was evidence of some protection. So this is from figure eight in our book. And it, again, you've seen, I think you've seen it before that basically when you test antibodies, your question is, has this person been exposed? So out there today in the modified drive up evaluation for those finger stick point of care blood spots, we actually had a patient come who had who was asking the question that was different. She had actually been feeling unwell. So she had a cough and a little bit of chest tightness. I said, whoa, this is the, the, the you should have a COVID swab testing. This for ex previous exposure. So um, you need to we need to be clear on what you're asking when you're doing antibody testing. So when we're doing antibody testing, we're asking the question, have you been exposed to the COVID-19 virus? Well, and I think, uh, go ahead. should be well. I mean, you, you, the sick patient, someone with symptoms should be having acute testing, which is the nasal swab. Right. When we do this testing, whether it's qualitative or quantitative for antibodies, they should be well. We're looking yes. for how they recovered from exposure. So remember that um, getting back to that slide with the uh, 
with the with the line. So basically, you shouldn't even get your antibodies tested until 14 days after symptoms. So here on the x-axis, look at the, how these lines work. First, remember IgM, you're in the middle of it. That's a teal one. It comes down there like the National Guard, like Dr. Kathleen said. And then the IgG starts coming in later. And you really want to wait until about day 14 or later after symptoms to get antibodies tested. And so it wasn't, so this lady who pulled up today had only been having symptoms for three days. So she's way over here in block one incubation phase and potentially infectious. When we're out there doing these types of testings, we don't want to see IgM because if we see both IgM and IgG, it means you're potentially infectious. And, and really this, uh, you could be infecting the healthcare team as well. But what we're doing is we're trying to see this green line, which she was saying was, we're hoping this green line on IgG extends all the way up to two years, very similarly to SARS-1 in 2002. But at least there's hope and evidence with a small monkey trial in the rhesus monkeys that that may actually be the case. Well, and the, and the reason for writing kick over to the curb is to help you understand that a healthy immune system that we know is going to help you survive and thrive is important if you want to create a robust antibody response if you're exposed or get infected with COVID-19. So if you have any exposure and if you get infected, the way to developing these antibodies and getting the response that we would like you to all have for herd immunity, the positive response to IgG is determined by multiple factors, but a primary factor is the health of your immune system. So one thing we wanted to touch on, but not dig into here is the utility of not only getting the qualitative tests, like this is patient zero, who actually had down here in the picture with the gloves, uh, there's a faint line where it says IgG. So she had come back from Italy in early March, had two negative COVID swabs being admitted to the hospital, but you know she was so sick and so hypoxic or having low oxygen levels that we were convinced, especially with an aunt who subsequently tested positive for COVID, that she had COVID and respiratory syncytial virus. So this was done two weeks ago and sure enough, she had COVID with RSV. But anyway, so that's a qualitative test. It's like a pregnancy test. Are you pregnant or not? The quantitation is measuring. So how pregnant are you? So patient zero actually has quantitative tests uh, pending currently. Do you want to speak to that, Dr. Kathleen, and what you think is the importance of quantifying how positive is your positive immunoglobulin sure. G? Sure. Well, I think when you heard about the patient here in Boston, the Italian woman who does not live in Italy, lives in Boston, um, but she's of Italian descent of, for 30 years. The reality is this, you never use one test to determine COVID-19 diagnosis, never. You, if you do a, she had multiple positive nasal, I mean, multiple nasal swabs that were negative, but she looked like COVID, smelled like COVID, acted like COVID, so she was COVID until proven otherwise, right? Which meant she stayed at home. Now, had she had some other, you know, significant symptoms, she might have gone to a hospital, but we managed them at home and she had been fortifying her immune system. So the reality is, is that you can, we need to risk stratify. We need to determine how big is the risk for a certain person and how much is the likelihood that they have been exposed to COVID. So we try the nasal swab, it's positive or negative. You, you know and I know that four to 10, four out of 10 people may be negative. That's a big, pretty big number. When we do the qualitative testing, this is easy testing, this qualitative testing to tell if you have a line for IgG, it's just like getting a pregnancy test. If you get the pink line on the pregnancy test, then you're likely pregnant. But in order to know how pregnant you are, as you said, and how sustainable that pregnancy will be, we need to do a quantitative, a number for your HCG with the blood tube. And when we do a number, we tell the viability the viability of the fetus. When we do a number with the quantitative antibody testing, we, we determine the viability of your immune system response. How robust is that immune system response? So the important thing is you know, to see, is there immune system response? And then if there is one, I think it's very important for us to do additional testing for quantitative numbers to understand the robust nature or not, of that antibody response. If somebody's negative 
on this qualitative test, it's very unlikely that they're going to have a robust antibody response. So for this one, which we carry here in the office, it's SD Bioscience and it's 97% sensitive and 97% specific. So if it's positive there, you probably have, you most likely have had the COVID-19 virus. So getting back to moving past this like pregnancy test or the point of care blood spot testing, which we did 20 of them today outside, if they're positive, then you should proceed to quantitating or measuring it because then we'll be able to develop the science to see at what level positivity you have to be protective and to not get infected again. And then we can also see, such as in patient number four, the healthcare worker who almost got intubated in our practice who refused and is now back in the healthcare system, we can follow this, this man's quantitation to see um, over time to see when his immune system starts getting tired again. Uh, if you look back to SARS-1 data from 2002, uh, that could be up to two years, and that's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, but I think that from 2002 till now, 18 years later, everything's shifting. Everything's, uh, you know, it's a very stressful time. This was unprecedented. This caught us off guard, unimaginable. And so I think that we really have to understand that stress is a friend of the virus, right? So we talk a little bit about that in the book and how to mitigate stress. And bad food is a friend of the virus because it creates inflammation or internal stress, maybe that you don't perceive, but it happens. So I think that we want you to have the most robust antibody response possible. And so we really wanna help you understand, here are some of the, here are 15 or 20 options that you can take and you get to choose, I'm gonna do five of them, or I'm gonna do three, or today I did four and tomorrow I'll do another three. But in any way that you can put these together and the number that you can put together will give you more money in the bank or antibodies in your immune system. So I would say that it's really, really a great guidebook. So I wanted to say, I wanted to, to talk to, to our um, listeners about what your, one of your famous sayings are is to spin the A story. And what Dr. Kathleen, you know, when I met her two years ago, she would always say, let's spin the A story, meaning let's remember the good stuff, the positive. Let's, uh, re let's see the lemonade beyond the lemon or, or the Easter Sunday behind the Good Friday. And this is what it is. It's like, you know, without this pandemic, we wouldn't be so tight as a community. We wouldn't have Dr. Kathleen coming in and now launching this webinar series. And, and when you spin the A story, you decrease cortisol. And cortisol is a hormone that's actually harmful to your immune system. It can actually work as well. So you need to make sure that you're thinking about the positive things and managing your stress through sleeping and exercising and connecting and eating well and breathing and all those things that we've talked about all along the way, which we outline very, very clearly in our guidebook. It's the tune-up. You've got to, this is a great pause for a tune-up. So, and you've got time for the tune-up. So we're learning as we go about this particular invader or this particular challenge, but it's not a challenge that we can't handle. Okay, so now we can move on to some Q&A. All right, Dr. Aiki, the first question I have for you guys um, says, I have friends going to hair salons for cuts and styles. Is it okay to get a haircut in a salon as long as the stylist is wearing a mask and they are cleaning after each person? Is that keeping the coronavirus out? So we're talking about opening up. So we're in the general category of now, at least in Florida, we've, we've mobilized, we've opened up. And so I've been messaging to at least our community that with the 6,000 patients, I've categorized you all into low risk. These are young, healthy, no medical problems. These are the interns that are at the office um, that should go out and work and take care of the community. Then you got moderate risk, which are like older people who are totally healthy or younger people with chronic disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. And then you've got high risk. So seniors with comorbid or two or more chronic diseases. And so you're asking whether or not you should go out into the community at this point. Um, I would say if in our population, if you're high risk or moderate risk, I still want you to shelter in at this point. The lower risk, no problem. Uh, if you do go out into a situation such as a grocery store or getting your hair cut or going to a restaurant, realize that it's mostly 
respiratory spread where you will end up getting uh, infected. Dr. Kathleen, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think we talked about risk stratification earlier. I think what you just said in terms of low, intermediate, and high risk or the vulnerable, you've got to stratify yourself. And I would err on the side of caution that if you don't know if you're in the intermediate risk or high risk category, but you're kind of thinking you could be, assume you are. Because it's important that we all care for ourselves. And if we all care for ourselves, when we care for each other, it will be easier. Okay, another question um, kind of going off that one is if they see people walking outside with friends, but they're not wearing masks, is it different than being indoors? I think it's very different. I think that the primary uh, location where the majority of infectious spread or transmission has occurred has been in indoor spaces. And even in indoor spaces, you all are in Florida uh, with air conditioning. So air conditioning is not protective um, in terms of being air blowing in an indoor space. The, there are one that's been documented, one, one outbreak that's been documented in outdoor spaces. So outdoor spaces, there's, it's harder for this bug to jump from person to person to person. In an indoor space, even at six feet apart, it's easier to jump. It doesn't mean it will jump, but it's a lot easier to jump. So outdoor spaces are safer, but I still believe that you need to follow the authorities of Florida or Boston or wherever you are, their recommendations. And I believe that the number one mode of transmission is respiratory droplets and a face mask of some sort, a face covering of some sort of all participants, if they're closer than six to nine feet, is essential. I agree with that. Okay, another question. If I come back on, if I swab test and it is negative, am I still a silent carrier? So we were alluding to the fact that the RT-PCR COVID swab testing has a 30% false negative rate, meaning even if you were a carrier, you'd miss three out of 10. So you have to take into account the clinical situation. Like, do you have symptoms? Do you have that, the loss of taste and smell? Do you have the chest pain? Do you have the shortness of breath? Do you have the headache? Do you have the diarrhea, nausea? Do you have the symptoms that look like COVID? Because if you're at, if if you you have symptoms that look like a COVID, it's COVID until proven otherwise. And so, could you be a carrier with a negative swab? Absolutely. Could you be infectious with a negative swab? Yes. So it it depends on the clinical um, presentation, whether how we would manage you, and that would be individualized with our telehealth uh, visits. Yeah, I think that's a really important question because that is a very confusing point because most transmission is asymptomatic. So if you believe you've been exposed, which most people are not going to know, then you could be a carrier for a period of time, call it a month. You know, I mean, at least we know that if you have been exposed, it's possible not necessarily likely, but possible that you could be a carrier. And to do your part in the community, you would not want, you would want to quarantine for 14 days, right? So as a, a, another potential silent carrier that can do transmission, if you have symptoms, and as Dr. Aki said, it looks like, smells like, sounds like COVID, then it's likely COVID. And you definitely need to be quarantined until you are 100% asymptomatic, regardless of your test result your nasal swab testing result, because you know we're still learning. We're still in the learning curve for this. So you remember in our population, that was Julie, patient zero, who came back from Italy, was around her aunt who had COVID, who got hypoxic, had fever, and yet two negative swabs in the hospital occurred with her. And it wasn't until antibody testing four or five weeks later that we were like, yeah, you definitely had COVID, although we always thought she had COVID. Perfect. Another question. This one comes from the chat. Can you address the specificity of the ABS testing your office utilizes? Can ABS to a different coronavirus versus SARS-CoV-2 be indicated? Okay. So if you're asking about the Quest venipuncture blood draw, I was on the webinar with the medical director of that lab, and he said, 
that um, it's 97% specific, but he wouldn't quote sensitivity because it's not really used for diagnosis. So he said the only cross reactive to, uh, to the, in the coronavirus family was actually to SARS-1, but there's no current SARS-1 out there. SARS-CoV-1 was from 2002. So my understanding, I think that's correct. And my understanding is that, you know, I've, I've looked at probably 10 labs who are doing testing, including Quest and including other quantitative labs and the SD biosensor. And I would say that the almost, well, I would say that all, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say all, never say all, never say never, right? But all tests are specific to COVID. And there's no COVID-1, which is the 2002 SARS. And for, for the 2002 SARS, there was no silent asymptomatic period. If you got exposed to SARS-1 back in 2002, you got sick. So it's not like there's a silent SARS-1 in the neighborhood. It's not there. So if you test positive, it is COVID-19. Okay, next question. Could some of us who had the horrendous flu experience in 2017, 2018 have had COVID without knowing it? I don't think so. I think that the, there's the three COVID families that have been um, documented to have been, been uh, very threatening, 2002 SARS-CoV-1, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome from 2012, and this one that just surfaced around late November, early December in, um, in China. So I don't think so, 2017, 2018, no. I would say no. I would say that if that were true, then we would have a lot more, we would be a lot closer to herd immunity. We would have a lot more positive, you know, we would be, would have more than 10% or 20% positive for these antibodies and we would, we would have herd immunity. So I think that the earliest that we believe at this point that COVID-19 showed up was in the late fall, early winter, December-ish. Uh, and I haven't seen any data that's definitive that there was anything early than December, earlier than December 2019. But never say never. Let's wait and see. But it's I, I think 2018 and 2017 are too long ago. Um, we have about five minutes left, so I think we're going to end the questions there for today. Um, yeah, Dr. Aki and Dr. Kathleen want to close us out, and then I'll play the outro. Yeah, so we, you know, we so appreciate you being involved and in, and in, and getting on these. Um, now it's a it's a Facebook Live, so we can you can invite your friends and family. There's no reason to even register anymore. And these questions are absolutely fantastic. Uh, we'll try to keep them in a question bank and we'll try to pull them together over time. We're not going anywhere. We don't think this pandemic's going anywhere. And now we got a commitment from my teaching partner, Dr. Kathleen O'Neill-Smith to come every Friday from three to 4 p.m. So thank you for being in our community. Kylie wants to tell you about the book and then we'll be wrapping it up. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen. Do you have anything else to say? Well, I would say that we hate when people don't feel well. We, we're here to help you be well. And we would love that if you know people who are not feeling well, that you will share this information with them so that they can join us on our Facebook Lives and learn how to be well. Because we want all of you to be well. And even those you love and those you come in contact with in the, in the, in the future, please invite them to join us so that we can increase the community and help all of us to fortify our immunity. So for now, be safe, be well, and God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Kathleen, for you. coming on the Fire Up Doctors webinar. So Kylie has something to tell you all. Hi, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us on this first really exciting Fire Up Doctors webinar. I know you've all heard about uh, our book. I just want to set a reminder, we are doing the launch week special. That'll be this week. So if you want to get those orders in, make sure to email N-F-I-M-G-M-V. That's Gators Make Victories, G-M-V at gmail.com. I'll type that in the chat. 
If you could email us before five o'clock, we're gonna be staying open till 5.30 today. So if you wanna pick up, we'll be here till then. And you can also, if you wanna have it shipped to your house, you can buy it from our website, the Fire Up Doctors website that I'm also gonna be sending in the chat. So you can order it on there and get it shipped right to your house if you live outside of Florida. Thank you everybody for joining us and we hope to see you next week. Bye. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope we've given you the tools to take control of your health. For more good medicine and information about any treatments, supplements, and resources discussed today, please visit us at www.firemobdoctors.com. That's F-I-R-R-I-M-O-Doctors.com. And wherever you're listening from, remember to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels so you don't miss out. The information provided is not a substitute for professional medical advice. This should not be used to diagnose, treat, or manage health problems without consultation. If you do experience any of the symptoms discussed today, please contact your nearest healthcare professional.